Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. It's very, very, very. You know, we've spent a lot of time over the last few weeks discussing the origin of ancient writings, and we, I have suggested on the basis of everything that we have shared together, uh, a fairly good degree of circumstantial evidence that we could say that the people of classical Greece, the ones that we know as the the really wise people of Greece, Aristotle, Diogenes, Pythagoras, and so forth, were actually from 45, 55. There's, there's, there's great evidence to say that that's true, namely because they were the teachers of 45, 55 at the Coptic school in Alexandria, Titius Flavius of, uh, of Greece and origin and so forth. And, 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 and so given that, you know, we, we look and we've considered because my goodness, at a time when most people were herding sheep and splitting rocks, these people were talking philosophy, anatomy, astronomy. In fact, Democrates was talking about electrons and atoms thousands of years before there was a Bible. And so, of course, my uh, first thought is not so much that they were so brilliant, but who taught them? I mean, who told, who told Zeno, Z-E-N-O? You can look his, and you can look into a book on quantum physics today, and look it back in the index and find references to Zeno. This guy was talking quantum physics 2,000 years before there was a, even anybody ever heard of a Christ. And so the point there would be, well, who taught them? Who told them this stuff? Where did this come from? I mean, I mean somebody must have taught, I mean, for, for a person has knowledge about the atom or about electrons, somebody must have taught that person, but there was nobody around to teach that person. And then when you look at the Coptic school of Alexandria, which was presided over by the Greeks, you find the symbol of Ada Zozio in 4555. They had to receive knowledge from somewhere. So we look at that, and then in addition to that, we looked at the, the myths, the mythology, as coded messages of cosmic proportion. Stories with hidden meanings about the universe, about things in the universe. We, we found ways to understand the mists hovering in the stars and the planets because, you know, in, in many instances, that's what they were talking about. One of the, one of the I think, most interesting things that we maybe haven't, we haven't poured over it as much as we should, but one of the most interesting things is the fact that the Greek myth about Hades, the most farthest, most dark place, the gateway to the underworld, was also known in the Greek mythology by the name of the god Pluto. And the little gray boatman, and keep that word gray is very important, the little gray boatman who ferried you across the river Styx to Hades was named Sharon. Well, this is thousands of years ago that, about this myth that Pluto, Hades, and Sharon. In 1930, that's only, what, 68 years ago. They discovered a, the most distant dark planet, and they named it Pluto. But, you know, there was something missing here. If we're going to say that this was, these people knew of this thousands of years before we did, there was still something missing. And then in 1978, they found it. Orbiting around Pluto, they found a little gray satellite. And they named it Charon. Here it is, all complete. But didn't happen until 68 years ago Pluto was discovered, and 20 years ago Charon was discovered, yet they were talked about thousands of years ago. Well, you, you know, you, you, people pick up Bibles and they're going into churches, and oh, I believe this, I have faith in this, oh, this is true, I don't, there's no question about it. But what we're offering here is documentation, scientific evidence, fulfillment of, of, of things that actually were talked about thousands of years ago. Pluto and Charon have shown up in our sky. I thought that's really fascinating. So you find out how things that have to do with your universe, your life, your mind, and all of this were, 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 were given to us by these, whoever they were, written in these strange ways. You, What's the biggest planet? Biggest, well, right, who's the god? 
Jupiter and Zeus. That's a, what's the, who is, what's the, what's the planet that has the fastest, the quickest orbit is named after the messenger, the fast messenger, Mercury. So, I mean, there's a reason that it's called Mercury, because it's fast. There's a reason cause it's called Jupiter and Zeus, because it's big. And everybody knows, I see red, and the color red has always metaphysically been one of violence, war. What's the war planet, the red planet? Mars. And the darkest, and the planet that's the gateway to the next world, Pluto. That's what they did. That's why. We've also learned from the myths about the relationships, about human nature, and its relationship. You know, I think Mary wants to sit next to you. Oh, I don't know where she's going. Oh, we're going back. You, you remember the story of the young fellow? And there was this young fellow, and he, he was a really good-looking guy. And he used to just go around and look in the mirror all the time. Oh, I am. <laughs> I really am cute. <laughs> but he was so taken by himself that everybody that came around, he didn't want any part of them. What? Don't touch me. Are you kidding? Get away. You know? Gosh. He was so self-centered, and so the gods brought him in, and they said, you know, you're too much. You are really a piece of cake. I mean, you, you won't even have anybody come near you. You won't have any touch you. You've got, we're, we're sending you to Mount Helicon. Now, Mount Helicon, the word Helicon comes from the Greek word helix, which means spiral. When you go to the Mount Helicon, you go to the place of meditation where the spiral energy comes up. You know, to, so they sent this guy to Mount Helicon, and there he has to sit by the lake. And he, he saw his, his reflection in the lake. And he said, wow, I, I could sit here forever. And he did. And he just kept staring at himself and staring at himself. And he finally pined away and just disappeared. And everybody, and the gods were having a meeting one day, you know, and they were saying, you remember that guy that we, whatever happened? He said, I, yeah, you know, we better go up. So they went up and they looked. And right where he was sitting by the lake, they found a flower. And they took the flower and they said, that was him. And they call the flower Narcissus. And narcissism is this obsession with oneself. But the point was that the story was telling us about those of us who concentrate on ourselves have to go to the spiral mountain, which is meditation, and there, gazing deep within ourselves, we are changed from that which is the lower symbolized by the physical to that which is the higher symbolized by the flower. All things pass away. All things become new. There was a, there was a story about this little girl, and she was an incessant talker. She never stopped. She'd get your ear, she would just never shut up. Never stop talking. So Zeus was coming down to Mount Helicon with, uh, with his wife, Hera. And Zeus knew of this little girl. And he was going to use her. Because she never shut up, she never stopped talking, she'd drive everybody nuts. Zeus was a philanderer. He wanted to jump in bed with all the nymphs on Mount Helicon. That's what he did. But he had to have somebody distract his wife so his wife wouldn't know what he was doing. So we got this little girl, and she said, what you doing? Just keep her busy, keep her occupied. So this little girl's talking to Zeus's wife, and all the while Zeus is jumping in and out of, with all of these women in, in, in Mount Helicon. No, I mean, you know, nobody was, nobody was the wiser. Nobody knew what was going on. In fact, you know what's interesting? Well, I'm talking about that. Do you know that Plato was, was one time looking at the stories of the gods? And this is amazing. When you talk about, this is 1990. This is a quote from Plato. He said that he was concerned about how the gods were portrayed with all their sexual or exploits. And Plato said, the philandering of Zeus is inappropriate behavior for a god. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Inappropriate behavior. It's bubble, maybe. Zeus. How do we know? <laughs> how do we know? Wouldn't that be something if he was? Oh, gosh. So anyhow, here's this little girl. This little girl is talking to Zeus's wife, and, and you know, and, and, and Zeus's wife never knows that Zeus is running from cabin to cabin up Mount Helicon having affairs with all these little limbs, and somebody spills the beans. It gets out of the bag, and Hera looks at this little girl, 
and she says, you are terrible, you have destroyed my marriage, you're destroying my relationship with my husband and all of these things. You have deceived me, you have kept me preoccupied with all of your chattering and rambling on. I never knew what he was doing. So Hera placed a curse on this little girl and from that point on, the little girl could never originate one thing. She could never say one thing. All she could ever do was repeat the end of somebody else's sentence. And her name was Echo. Hmm. Well, one day before he had gone up to Helicon, uh, Narcissus was out in the woods and he was hunting. And he got separated from his hunting party. He said, he got lost. And Echo was hiding behind a tree. She saw, she said, this guy is cool. She, this is a good looking guy. But she could only talk to herself. She couldn't say anything. So she's hiding behind the trees and looking at him where he goes and all this kind of stuff, you know, and there he goes. And so anyhow, he got a little bit scared. And, and he then put his hands up to his mouth and he yelled out. And he said, is anyone here? Back came the word, here, here. It was an echo. So he said, well, let's come together. And echo <laughs> running out from behind the trees. And she thought this was great. And she had her arms wide out. And she's running up to Narcissus. And just as she almost got to Narcissus, he pushed her back. And he says, stop, don't touch me. I would sooner die than have you make love to me. And the words came back, make love to me. <laughs> then he said, no, 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 I don't want you to touch me. And the words come back, touch me. <laughs> so anyhow, he, he pushed her away and shoved her away. And she went forlorn back into the forest, back amongst the trees, and she was never seen again. But you, any time you want, can go up into the mountains, and you can call out, and you can say, hello, and she'll answer. She'll say, hello. <laughs> She's still there, Echo. Well, it's a cute story. The origin of Echo and Narcissus and all of these things, but these guys weren't fooling around. They didn't have time to sit down and write silly stories to occupy people's time. See? The story is similar to the Uranus story. Remember? Uranus and Gaia were married and then Kronos castrated Uranus. And so what was being said there was that no longer could the seed of God enter into the mind of mankind because of the activities of Saturn, which was the lower mind, or Satan. It was God's way. In this story, Echo plays the part of that one inside of your mind who distracts the emotions. It can be your meditation, it can be ohm, it can be sounds, it can be music, whatever it is. It's distracting your mind from focusing on the lower. And in the, and in the little story, Hera, who is Zeus's wife, is representative of the emotional nature. So, so then a little echo uh, symbolizes that, which distracts the emotions so that God can intercourse with you. God intercourses with you by com communing uh, the message, the electromagnetism, whatever, the, the meditation with you. So, but if we look what happens, when you see that we're not able to stay within ourselves and instead we're then suddenly controlled by the lower emotions. And now Echo is controlled by the lower emotions and then all she can do is repeat what others say. And that's what happens to us. When we're no longer able to control the lower emotions, when Echo is no longer able to control Hera, then the lower emotions, Hera, is able to control Echo, and then all we are are parrots for whatever they say. And you know how that goes, and we've been parroting it all our lives. Everybody says, praise the Lord, and what do you all say? Praise the Lord. God is good, God is good. Stand up, you stand up. Sit down, you sit down. Kneel, kneel, kneel. We're all echoes. We're all repeating whatever is told. We are an echo lost in the woods of religion and tradition. It says this for all of these stories. And these stories have great, 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 great meaning. And it doesn't take that much to sit down and, and start to look at them. But of course, mainly in the context of where we're at right now, 
what are we looking for? We're looking, we're looking for something here because this Pluto, which is the gateway to the next world, to the netherworld, will not achieve that orbit, which places us in the, places it in the position of being the orbit to the next world until March 15th, 1999. The Ides of March 15th, 1999, Pluto will assume its position with Charon as the gateway to the next world. That's in the significance. It's not that far away. And then NASA has told us that the light from supernova 1987A will touch us in approximately 2002. And that's not that far away. So all of these things become very interesting because we're, we're seeing the, the universe setting itself up in a fulfillment of these words that were written by people thousands of years ago who quite possibly were from 4555. We're learning about how our inner self, our inner consciousness works on the basis of these same stories that were told thousands of years ago. And, 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 and now we come to the point where we can start studying together how this all works. This is a wonderful thing. I, you know, how long did I spend sitting at a, at a computer, I'm sure Albert and the rest of you sat at a computer, and I wasn't able to use the benefits of the computer because I didn't understand, I didn't know you could do these things. And as you start to use them and as you start to work on it, you learn how to use different parts of it, and suddenly you find out, gosh, you know, I can do so much that I couldn't do before. Well, it's the same thing here on life, but all we've ever been able to do is go into a church and listen to somebody say to us, have faith, and uh, the, the snake talked to the lady, and the lady gave the guy an apple, and all this stuff, and it's, uh, we don't go any further than that. So we miss, we miss understanding the very essence of our life. We miss understanding the very reason that we're here, and we cannot work our, ourselves as people, we cannot work in a harmony w with all of life. Last week when we were talking with Dr. Gibbons, who is a, an astrophysicist at Cambridge, describing this electromagnetic radiation moving back and forth in the universe like a, a giant web, waves of moving back and forth, energy coming to us from God, energy going from us to God or to other people, all interreacting in this web. And then he said that as a result of this, each individual particle, including the ones inside of your body, are instantaneously aware of their position in relationship to all of the other particles. And you know, that was an amazing thing because you have a web in your head. You have an old arachnoid. Arachnoid is the web, the, sp the web that was spun. One of the things we'll talk about down the road is the confrontation between Athena and the little girl who would sit at the loom and spin all of these beautiful things. And they had a contest between Arachnoid and this little girl. And, th and they both made these beautiful rugs or whatever they made on the loom. But when they compared them and Athena looked at the little girl, she had made a picture of Zeus having an affair with one of the nymphs. She got ticked off and Athena turned the little girl into a spider who weaved her web, and her name was arachnoid. And arachnoid is the web in your head which separates the dura mater from the pia mater, which separates the hard mother, the hard or outer covering of the brain from the innermost sensitive part. And what, what Gibbons, what Dr. Gibbons said to me, or said to us, which was so interesting, and I thought, he said, poke an electron here in a laboratory on Earth. Just poke it, you know, like little Pillsbury Doughboy, boop. Poke, poke it. And when you poke that electron on Earth, every charged particle in the Andromeda galaxy, more than two million light years away, know that something's happened. And it's like, touch the web and, and the spider comes. Touch the web and the one in the center comes down to touch you. The vibration is just like touching a spider web, but it's something that we previously misunderstood as spirit. Well, it's not spirit. There's a, there's a mighty web, a, a web that interconnects everything in the universe, including the electron. And there's electrons or photons at the center of the hippocampus of your brain, which are, which are created specifically for delivering you messages and for transporting messages from you to others. And that's interconnected with everything in the universe. And you have a twin waiting at some other place, probably 4555. It doesn't look like you. 
but it is you. The only reason it doesn't look like you is because you've picked up all of the stuff from all of your um, ancestors. Some of them were nuts. But we all picked up and they all came downstream and piled into us and we got all this junk. So then when you get back, you don't, you don't take this stuff with you. They won't allow this stuff up there. So you put all of this together and have the mists express deep, mysterious truths in the webs and the vibrations. You see, in the ancient times, what they used to teach was there was a celestial hierarchy that ran through seven planetary gods, which were the Moon, Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. They didn't know of Uranus and Pluto at that time. But consider this highway as the web. Because they felt that these planetary gods that they talked about, say, were, were connected with the outermost realm. In other words, touch the web and the spider comes running down, you know. But we're talking in a different thing. We're saying touch the web and God comes running down. Now we're finding there's a logical reason. There is a web. And all of the particles in the universe are interconnected. And you have these particles inside of you. And when you look inside of yourself in meditation, you collapse the wave to a particle. And that particle can go or the particle can enter. And it comes right from... So if you touch it, the particular place in the universe, whether it be Pegasus or wherever where this message originated, knows that you're sending a message or you're receiving one back. We're starting to understand that there's a logical explanation how this works. Remember what they said, it's impossible to step in the same river twice. I mean, everything is in this constant state of motion, in this constant state of, of flux. And you've got to be a watcher. You've got to observe. There are messages coming down for you. And they're going right over your head like a wave in, in the ocean down at the beach because you're not watching. But as soon as you watch, that wave collapses. And the message that enters is a particle through the pineal gland and finds its way to the place where you used to be. I mean, you know, there was a guy named Posidonius uh, of, of Greece, and, and he took a look, and he saw that the tides of the sea corresponded with the phases of the moon. And so then he came up with the central idea that there's a harmony between the planets and the earth. It couldn't just be between the moon and the earth or the sun and the earth, that there was a harmony between all of these things. You know, religion was, oh, well, don't get involved in that. That's astrology. That's nonsense. But they talk about talking snakes and fish throwing up and preachers coming out of the throw up fish and all of this stuff. And that's okay. But Poseidon is taught that the lower world, which is the earth, which is where we live, is nourished and lives by the energy which comes down from the planets. It's interesting. The dynamic of electromagnetic power streaming down to the earth from above. And that became the origin of the Greek myth that we know as what? Jesus. The sun. 888, the number in Greek. The sun. Crucified, born of the virgin, the whole bit. Just like the sun's trajectory takes it to the, the 12 signs. Plato taught that the celestial ascent and descent of the soul is energy which with each one of us rises out of physical death. And you know what? You know what he taught? I mean, this is Plato, so he's no nut, he's no new, new age guy. You know what he, he said that as your angle of light comes down, coming to your mother, so that it can enter through your mother's pineal and then enter into the fetus, which is you, as it is coming down, it starts to pick up negative energy from each of the planets. And then it arrives at you. And then he said when you leave and you ascend back up, you take all of that stuff and you drop it off at each of the planets, all of the negative, and then you're out of it. And you go right back up and you leave all that stuff that you dropped and give it back. Like, who knows? So the planets became the ruler of the fate of mankind, which is, which is hard for a lot of people to believe, but at the same time, try to understand that the people who wrote about the stars and the planets, this is something that you have to understand, the people that wrote about the stars and the planets were the very same people who wrote the Bible. Old Testament and New Testament. You saw, well, the Old Testament was written by the Jews. The Jews were of Hellenistic Egypt. They didn't speak Hebrew at all. They spoke Greek. 
So the Bible contains astrological information about things that can happen to you. The Bible does. There was a guy, there was a guy named Cicero, and this guy was a, a hotshot warrior. I mean, he, you know, he was in the army, and I mean, he was victorious all over the place, and he led armies and destroyed people, never had a problem. One day, everything went wrong. He lost his troop, and they fell off his horse, and he's running around, and he's trying to, to, to find some place to hide because the other armies are coming after him. And as he's running by his tent, and there's this good-looking little thing standing by the tent. <laughs> and she says, come here, sissy. His name is Cicero. She called him sissy. She said, would you like some warm milk? He said, that'd be nice. She said, this is a bad. He said, you can't believe this day. I mean, he said, I've never had a day like this. Everything, everything is screwed up. Everything's gone wrong. He said, I'm going to get killed. Oh, she said, no. No. So she has, gives him this warm milk and pucks him when he lays down on the floor. When she's, when she's got him sound asleep, she picks up a tent peg and a hammer, gets his head right on the side, puts it at the temple, and whack. So much for him. I mean, what happened to this guy? This guy, this guy was a warrior that could destroy all of the armies. I mean, he never lost anybody. He had his sword, you know, you know on his horse, and the whole thing. And he gets hit by a little lady with a hot drink of milk and a tent peg, and that's the end of him. What happened to him? This is the day that Sisera should have stayed in bed. Why? Let's look. Go to page 215 in the bottom. Look what it says. Page 215. And on page 215, you come to the book of Judges. And it talks about this thing. And if you look at page 215 in Judges chapter 5, look what it says in verse 20. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. What's it saying to you? He didn't have a chance that day. This is the Bible. So when you know that these planets have an effect, the stars have an effect on what happens to you, and somebody will say, how do you know? And what do you all say? How do I know? The Bible taught me so. Because it's in the Bible. See? So, I mean, Plato said that while direct knowledge of universal principles demands a bit of preparation, and it obviously does, there still is implicit within every soul the highest form of genuine light. In other words, you know, the musical scale is based on certain ratios, don't worry me if and universal ratios of harmonics, which are mathematical. But you don't have to understand that to listen to Frank Sinatra or listen to the Beatles or listen to Kataro or whatever you want to listen to. You just enjoy it. Because it's there. It doesn't require you to understand it to be part of it. But I mean, if you are really, really into this and you get into music and you start studying music, but if you're not, it's no interest to you and you don't understand. You don't have to be an electrical engineer to use a toaster. But a little basic knowledge of a, the nature of electricity reduces your likelihood of getting a shock. You know, when you take the light bulb out, don't put your finger in there. That doesn't mean you have to be a genius to understand that, but understanding that. So what we're trying to do here is in the same way, this knowledge, this little bit of knowledge about the universe and how it operates allows you, your family, your children to prosper and to flow in harmony with it. So how is all this, how is all this communicated to us? People are always saying, well, why didn't they just say this in the very beginning, you know, in the plain line? Which, of course, people thousands of years ago couldn't understand atoms or quantum or any of those things, so they couldn't. But now is the time when this can be understood, and you can understand it. You should understand it. It's not hard for you to understand. Most of the things that we talk about is in a cosmic language. What language can God use to communicate? Is he going to talk French? Is he going to talk English? Is he going to talk Italian or any of those things? But there are no words to describe these things. Could you discuss the telephone in, in, in the year 1314, 1325? Well, do you have a cell phone? Are you going to talk to some guy in, in 1300 say, do you have a cell phone? Do you, know what a cell, you have a cell phone? Do you have television? What do you have? There's no such words. There's no such things. You can't talk about that. 
Now you can talk about those things, but I can tell you of things that we can't talk about now because you couldn't deal with it. You haven't reached that point yet. So you have to wait. So how do we, how do we convey truths? Albert can tell you from his scientific background that often scientists cannot express their insights in words. They have to use mathematical formulas. Is that true? True. Because there are no words to express this. I mean, one of the things that Albert taught me a long time ago was that two and two do not necessarily mean uh, add up to four. But you can't express that in words, so you have to express it in a mathematical formula to prove it. The word mystic is a Greek word from M-U-O, and it means be silent. The highest level of insight is realized from the nature of silence. I love this statement from Plato. He said, after a long period of study, true insight like a blaze kindled by a leaping spark is generated in the soul. Jesus, you don't even know the guy existed. This guy, Plato, reduced everything to paper. You can buy, you know, you can go to Barnes and Noble and buy his books. I don't know if he gets any money for it, but books are played. You can. You can buy his books today. Both Pythagoras and Plato believe that scientific inquiry into mathematical principles was spiritual, but of course Christianity and the church couldn't deal with this because they emphasized this un, you know, moved belief in dogma, their control. But when we come to understand the nature that we live in, we begin to appreciate its nature. The Gnostics blasted the idea of Jehovah, the one God. I am the only true God. They said there was many levels of, of hierarchy of reality. And so Jesus in the Bible is constantly shown blasting religion at every opportunity. Why? Because he's carrying through this Greek idea. They were trying to convey this idea. And the Greeks believed, Pythagoras believed in transmigration of the soul. He said he had lived before. And that he remembered where he was before. And they believed that you came from different places and here and then left and so forth. But religion couldn't deal with that. And they said the only way that you could understand that was by entering inside of yourself, by observing, by watching, by collapsing this wave function. But what, so, so what words do they give Jesus to say in the Bible? Look at page 847 in, in the book of Luke. And in Luke chapter 11 is one of, the, one of the great statements of what they're all guilty of to this day. And I'm not beating up on them because I don't really care anymore. But in Luke 11.52, Jesus says, Woe well, unto you lawyers, and lawyers are those who interpreted the law, the religious law of the day. You have taken away the key of knowledge. He's, he's accusing Bible scholars of taking away the key of knowledge. And they say, well, how? Why? Well, what do you explain yourself? He says, you have taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, you hindered. How clear does it have to be? You entered not, you didn't enter in yourself. So you took away the key of knowledge. And other people who were trying to do that, you're saying, don't do that. The very thing that they do in the church today, if you go in any of those churches today and say you're going to meditate and you separate from the thoughts of the mind, they say, don't do that, you'll open your mind to devils. It's exactly what they'll tell you. Look at page 800. And in page 800 in the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew chapter 23, and, and look at verse 13, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. That's religious people. Hypocrites! You shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor suffer, nor do you allow them that are entering to go in. There it is. And those are the words that he's given by the Greek scholars. The scripture says, seek and you'll find, knock and it will be opened. This is the way of the Pythagoreans. The parable was a story of life that was helpful to, to the masses, but it transmits a higher message to you. You have to understand it. You, we told you about uh, the message about Echo and Narcissus this morning. Now, there's a higher message in those little stories about the little chattering girl and the Echo and so forth and so on. There's a much higher message to that, which we shared with you. And that's why uh, Paul in the Bible says, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world. We speak the wisdom of God and a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which was ordained before the world. And that's what we're talking about. And the wisdom, hidden wisdom is the wisdom of quantum. The hidden wisdom is the wisdom of the subatomic. And Galileo, whom religion destroyed, Christianity destroyed, said that philosophy is written in the great book which is ever before our eyes. And Galileo says, I mean the universe. So how do, we, how do we do this? Here's a, 
just give me an idea. Here is a god. His name is Abraxas. And Abraxas represents the sun. Okay? And the numerical value of his name is 365. Now, what's that? The relation of the sun to the earth in the same way that a physicist equation shows you the workings of the universe, they're giving you the story of Abraxas doing the very same thing by showing you it's 365. It is the working of the sun and the earth. So when you look at this guy's Abraxas and you're reading this silly story, you're missing the fact that it's actually talking about the sun. In Greece, in ancient Greece, there was a Zephonomies. He spoke of one God, and Plato and Aristotle spoke of a transcendent, you know, divinity. The universe is one, yes, but it's many. In the same way that a song, I heard this song, it's a beautiful song, but it's made of many notes. So in other words, God and the universe and you and I are many, but we're one at the same time. So you begin to understand why these things had to be hidden. In older times, people obviously couldn't discuss quantum and so forth. But yet Zeno was talking of quantum physics and Democrates was talking about electrons. And they were the ones that gave you the, the, the basis for your culture, for your, for, for your civilization. But the myth also protected the truth from the ones who would profane it. But you don't have to worry about that. Because you don't hang out with them. You, don't, you, don't, you can't even deal with that. Turn on the television and watch these people come on television. You can't deal with it. Because they're not talking about the reality of the universe. And it compels you to want to go higher and find more and more and more because you know this is true now. This is scientifically true. Whenever you read a myth, you try to understand the stories about gods are associated with the cycles, the phenomena of nature, Dionysius, Osiris, Artis. All of these are the vegetation cycle, the cycle of the earth, the cycle of the moon, the cycle of the planets. You yourself are a myth. Look at yourself. Look at the chairs, look at them around, look at everything you're sitting in. You appear to be one thing, but I look at you and I don't see who you, who you appear to be here with your Halloween costumes on, pretending that you're a part of... You're, you're going to give that costume back when you leave. It's only a costume you're wearing. You have no connection with it, other than to act out this part that you're... But I look at the subatomic particles, that real part of you that communicates on the, on the, on the world wide web with the universe. And that the universe is trying to communicate with you simply by getting you to watch and to observe and to collapse the wave function. You see, let me give you another example, just real quick, how, how this is done. When you, when you look at the word silver, the word silver means the lower mind. Okay? The number 30, the number 30 is sin. The god sin is represented by the number 30. So Judas betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Okay? It is the sin of the mind. The collapsing of the falling of the mind. It is the mind that just causes us to abandon that which is the Christ consciousness, so we betray it for 30 pieces of silver. The mind, that's the way it works. See, the way in Greek, you have the way each letter you'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That would be the first set of letters, okay? So this would be alpha. It would be one. And then the second set are 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. That would be the second set. And then the third set would be 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800. That would be omega. See? So Jesus says, I am the Alpha, I am the Omega. The beginning and the end. A, and, here. and what happens when he gets baptized, a dove comes down and lights on his shoulder. Did you ever read that story? Well, the word dove in Greek, in Greek, has a numerical value of 801, the beginning and the end. It's all, it's all set up. It's, it's, you know, it's, that didn't really happen. <laughs> well, we just had some dove, a bird comes down and spills on your shoulder. What big deal is that? See, <laughs> did you ever tell you this story? 
But the story about the guy that's out drunk and he's hunting out of season. And the game warden comes. He says, hey, you! The guy's coming up the, coming up, staggering up the pathway. He's got this deer over his shoulder, dead deer. And the, and the game warden says, hey, what are you doing hunting out of season? The guy was stoned. He says, this is ridiculous. I was not hunting out of season. I was just in for looking at the woods. And the game warden said, well, what's that on your shoulder? And he goes, ooh! <laughs> yeah. So then, you see, when, when you look at this, you see, it says in, in Philippians 2.9, God has exalted Jesus and given him a name which is above every name. Why? Because the name Jesus in Greek has a numerical value of 888. It's the mythical sun in the sky, all right? So why is it above me? It reflects 24. Three eights are 24, which are the number of letters in the classic Greek alphabet. And you have eight units, one to eight. You have eight tens, 10 to 80. You have eight hundreds, 100 to 800. Jesus is therefore alpha and omega, the all encompassing the name above all names. And then the dove comes down and writes on his shoulder as 801. That's the name above all names. But it all has to do with mathematics. And there's tons of things that are in there, see? That's how you come up with a 45, 55. Yeah. It's, it's all part of, uh, uh, that's the way in Hebrew and in ancient Greek they wrote in each of the letters had a numerical value. In the Bible, Jesus raises on the eighth day. It's the day of the sun. It's Helios. In other words, creation took place on Sunday, the day of the sun. The process was completed on Saturday, the day of Saturn. Jesus rises on Sunday. The eighth, it ushers in a new day of creation, a new time of creation. See, look, if you take, and it's, this is the way they work, when you, when you see like that we showed you the harmony of Apollo and all that kind of business, if you take, for instance, um, a circle like this, and the circumference of it, say, is 891, all right? Now, 891, if you made that circle, would be Uranus, heaven. It's the word for heaven, is 891. Well, the diameter of 891, of course, that will be 284, which is Theos, or God. It's the way it comes out. You know? So God, then, Dwell the abode of God and divinity is in the heavenly spirit. So all things are hidden. And all things are done in numbers and mathematics and things like that. And that's why Clement of Alexandria at the Coptic school gave us 4555. And he said, it is not wished that wisdom be communicated to those who have not even in a dream been purified in soul. It is not wished that these people up there know this stuff because they haven't been purified in meditation. Origin of Alexandria said that the Logos appears in many forms, always appropriate. Now, this is something interesting and important for you to hear. Listen to what he said. He was one of the teachers at the Coptic school. The Logos, or the knowledge of harmony, always appears in many forms, always appropriate to an individual's present level of understanding. You don't have to be a quantum physicist to understand this stuff. You don't have to be a quantum physicist or a scientist to have it touch you. See, uh, one of the ancient Christian documents terminated with 99, which is the number of the word amen. Let me just show you something that in, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 17, it says, the covenant confirmed before God and Christ the law, which was 430 years, and it says, that cannot be disannulled to make the promise of none effect. So the, the number 430 years in Galatians um, 317 is important. What is being said is that the Mosaic law came 430 years after God's covenant with Abraham. What is interesting is that the word for law is N-O-M-O-E in Greek, and the numerical value of that is 430. Okay. So you say, well, you know, so what, so what, so what. Because everything put down there, transcribed and moved around and so forth, is a great cosmic universal code of universal order. So let, let's just, um, let me just do one thing with you, and then we'll let you go. We'll consider a myth 
And I, I told you about it a little while ago. And, and let's just consider this. And what I'm trying to get you to understand is this is all, has all been laid out for you. And it is available to you. And it will now be more available to you as you learn to work with the question of electromagnetic energy coming in waves, that by watching yourself, by entering into meditation and closing your eyes, and in a dark room simply saying, I am watching myself, that you will collapse the wave function. You say, well, then what happens? That's none of your business what happens. This lady said to me last night, well, now, will I hear it when it collapses? No. You won't see it when it collapses. Let me, you have to trust it. You have to trust that when it enters into your brain as a wave particle, that it collapses to a particle. You have to trust that what is going to happen is right. It should have. Now, when you eat food, what, do, you, do you follow it down? <laughs> do you make sure that everything, what do you do? Do you listen? Sometimes you do hear it, but I mean, you know, other than that. The point is you just let it go, don't you? You just let it do whatever it does. Do you go to sleep and wonder? Well, I'm, I'm just kind of shutting everything off. I wonder if I'm going to wake up. I mean, wonder will I come up tomorrow morning? You just you take your shot. You may not. But you take your shot, and so far, since you're sitting here, you have. Every morning, you have come out of it, haven't you? But you didn't know for sure that you would. And so what you're doing, then you're trusting the universe that what is going to happen is right. What I'm saying to you, when you turn, you look inside of yourself, you collapse the wave function, and you call it a particle function, you go ahead. Now let me just tell you this, once during the, you're out of here, I promise we'll do anything after this. Athena is the goddess of wisdom. She is wisdom, okay? Her constant companion was somebody that you people wear or some of us were, named Nike. That was a constant companion. And Nike is the spirit of victory. What's the message being conveyed right there? You'll say, well, Athena's hanging around with Nike. Well, that's a myth, but what's the message? Wisdom hangs around with victory. Overcoming problems is through wisdom, not through faith, not through prayer, through wisdom, through understanding. When you understand, you'll overcome. So, so we see that. So we have a stage set. Wisdom goes hand in hand with victory, overcoming challenges, overcoming fear, overcoming hurt. So Athena hangs out with Nike. Now, Athena was very skillful in looming. I told you about this before. But, you know, knitting. Which means wisdom creates beauty. Wisdom creates beauty. She taught others, and one of her students was a young girl by the name of Arachne. That was her name. She was, she was good at this. You know, and if you look in, in page 25 of the stuff you have, you'll see that you have an arachnoid, which is the web of the brain. Well, Arachne became skilled at the loom, and she went around telling everybody, Arachne said, look at the stuff I've made. Here, I made this on the loom. Would you like to take these? I'm selling these. And she said, gee, that's terrific. You are really, really good. But she didn't tell anybody that Athena had taught her how to do all that. She said, well, how did you learn to do all this? And Arachne said, I learned it myself. I just went ahead and did it myself. She never said that. And she even said, and, and they said, well, you should see Athena does these. Oh, she's beautiful. And Arachne said, C -c please, it's trash compared to what I can do. Just pure trash. Look at this. Well, anyhow, this stuff, uh, this got back. But what, what, what is happening here? Arachne, who will become arachnoid, is the human brain. And the human brain is boasting how skillful it is and how it does not need anything to do with the cosmos. It has nothing to do, needs nothing to do with the universe or with God. It is totally self-sufficient. I'll do it my way. I did it my way or something. It's pride of the human mind. Well, the story goes on that Athena heard that Arachne was boasting and not giving her credit, and so she got disguised as a scraggly old lady, and she came in with a crooked stick and came in and then knocked on the door, and, you know, Arachne opened the door, and they started talking about this, and the lady was saying, oh, that's beautiful things you make, and Arachne says, yes, I mean, and, 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 and the lady said, I heard that uh, Athena had, a, oh, no, she never had anything to do with this. I did it all myself. Huh. 
So here is a Rachmi who will become a Rachnoid, which is the human brain, boasting of how skillful it is. And here then is the inner spirit, if you will, trying to guide us to an understanding of higher things, telling us, now wait a minute. Athena, as the old lady was saying, you know, you should really give a little credit. No, no, no. Well, Arachne wouldn't have anything to do with this, and she told the disguised Athena, if Athena thinks she's so good, let her come here, and I'll challenge her to a duel with the moon. <laughs> and Athena threw her cane down, ripped off her wig, took off her tattered off thing, and explosions, <laughs> cosmic gold started showering all over, and there she stood, the goddess Athena. Again, the pride inherent in the lower is own contemptuous of this. It is religion that demands allegiance of the people instead of sending people to the inner kingdom of meditation. So Athena couldn't take it anymore, and she accepted the challenge, and they both made two beautiful pieces. But Arachnes, as I said, was making fun of Zeus's sexual exploits, and Athena got so ticked that she struck Arachne and turned her into a spider. And Arachne weaved a web which is your brain. And she is inside of your head right now. 